Yes, so very good morning. Right, so I welcome you all to the CA final. Yes, advanced auditing and professional ethics. New syllabus course, yes, for the new course students. The batch, the entire syllabus we will try to cover in this particular batch, yes. Uh, a lot of rather, I think I should begin my discussion talking about MCQs, okay. And uh, so what about MCQs? Are we going to get a separate book? Are they going to be discussed? So for MCQs, uh, I think you should study from the module. Good idea? No, not at all? Okay. <laughs> so MCQs, there is a lot of conceptual understanding, more detailed understanding which is expected for MCQs. So as we proceed with the class, we will also be giving, we'll also be discussing a few MCQs and now looking at the content of the syllabus from the viewpoint of MCQs, okay, how a question on this one could be asked in the exams. Okay, right. So this first part in the batch, we will be covering the entire standards, right? So how many standards in your syllabus? Okay, at CA final also, you know, students write in the, you know, when the audit report question comes and they write down over there, okay, we have conducted our audit in accordance with the accounting standards or they, some are upgraded. They say, no, no, not accounting standards, international financial reporting standards. Or some say, no, no, Indian company, not IFRS, Indian companies, NDS. So cleared inter, after clearing IPCC, still they don't know that in audit also there is something called as standards. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so because the accounting standards are taking so much of your time that it's far away that you know something about the standards in audit also. And then uh, how many of you studied standards at inter? I asked you studied. I didn't ask you if you knew whether they are in the syllabus. So whether you studied or not, at CA final, I always teach, uh, teach standards with the assumption that at inter you have left it an option. <laughs> I know, right. And most, of, like maximum you would have studied is SA 200. And if you study the, if you study the title of SA 200, if you know the entire title of 200, overall objectives of the independent auditor and the conduct of an audit in accordance with the standards on auditing, you think, ah, I know so much audit. <laughs> Such a big name I know. Well, if you like give a, what do you say, a credit to yourself only, I know audit, huh? big name. My friends, they say only SA 200 overall objectives. I at least say the entire name, you know. Okay. Right, so that is how it doesn't work. You see, every question paper of ICAI and each question paper of ICAI is a bundle of surprise. Okay, every paper, so rather now your life has got more work, you know, you're more occupied right now because there is old syllabus paper, there is new syllabus paper, there is RTP for old syllabus, there is new syllabus. So it gives you more, what you say, more content, more material for doing R&D, research and development. This was asked in old, you know, so now this question can come in new. Then new, new this has come, so it will come in old and all that fails. Okay, nothing of this works with ICAI. Okay, the only simple way to clear the exam is that you should cover the entire syllabus without leaving anything in option. So the only option for you right now is not to leave anything in option. You understand? So still, you know, even after I saying this, some students, they ask, but madam, important questions. <laughs> madam, three chapters I want to do properly. So which other three chapters, you know, which two chapters I can leave an option. So madam, bank, it's okay, na, if I don't do. Only practice manual, say, if I do bank, insurance company, is it okay? Okay, rest you study November 19. Then you study May 20. You know, you can keep on writing the exams with your children. No problem. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> there is no limit over here regarding how many attempts. So every attempt, see, there are 46 standards. So every attempt, you study one standard. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't happen that way. So we have to cover the entire syllabus. Then I came to know that a few of you are skeptical over here, you know, okay, 6 to 9 in the morning, we are doing a class, or 6.30 to 9.30, whatever time. Then again, evening, 6 to 9, you are doing a class. So then how to do audit in the afternoon? Why did this question come in your mind? Well, why does this thought even, why do you underestimate yourself? You have to. Well, 
I have I have a question. Like you have to study, you have to study, and anyways later on you have to study 14 hours a day, not in a week. Okay. <laughs> You have to study 14 hours a day in the library. So this is a trailer before the six-month movie. <laughs> you understand? No. So I don't uh, think that there is any um, thoughts. Don't underestimate yourself. And see, anyways, I know going back to your room or hostel or house, wherever, you know, nine, ten, you do a class and then after that, anyways, you'll keep on pampering yourself. And then you'll say, no, no, I'm very tired. Then evening, I cannot concentrate. So let me sleep for two hours. So rather than sleeping at home, sleep over here, no, in the class. At least, you know, something will go in the brain. And, then, and you, I'm telling you, listening to audit, there can't be a better anesthesia than that. OK? <laughs> so you will say, all sleep medicines are not as effective, you know, as audit is. So you even don't think about it, you know, of, okay, how will I do the class? That I, my question is, okay, why is the thought coming into your mind? It's, and then you will realize, you know, okay, okay, it was a, like, you know, few days, 20 days. It was a bit painful, little bit of self-discipline was required. But you know, at least the mountain, the Mount Everest summit has been reached. So... Any, because on your own, there is a limit to how much you can study. And doing class for audit is very essential because, you know, then once you have done the class and then when you open the book, then you can more correlate, you know, Ki yes, I have done the marking, there is something in the book that I've studied. So it's very recommended for a theory subject. You also develop your writing skills, you know, you learn, you know the content for writing the answers and so in the class. Okay. Right, in addition to that, I expect you to get some, uh, one notebook, yes, 200 pages notebook, and some stationery which I want you to get. So stationery would mean red, green, blue, black pen, okay? Then uh, one or two highlighters, okay? And in addition to that, a few post-its. This is not compulsory, this is not an art and craft class. Okay, so we are not here for the intention of decorating our audit book, but yes, certainly it brings our book alive. And you know, when you keep on doing marking, when you keep on doing coloring, then there is more, less of a probability that you will sleep also. Okay, so that is why, and it is very beneficial. But I have always seen, you know, when I tell students, you know, you should do marking, you should put post-its, when I make charts, you need to copy down those. They color it so much, they decorate it so much that I have a question, what is to be colored is to be studied or what is not to be colored is to be studied. But there is so much. So obviously you have to draw, a, what do you say, a, what do you, balance between the two. You have to strike a balance between the two. Okay, I write a lot in the class when I'm teaching you. Okay, one, because it allows me to spend more time with the concept when I'm writing. Because if I just speak and go ahead, it will be faster as compared to when I write. So I do a good amount of writing in the class. It is expected that as and when I write, you can also write down. I won't be waiting much for you to finish and then you copy writing, nothing of that sort. And if you don't finish writing anything, it's okay. Well, if it's not something very important chart, okay, during the break or, you know, at that particular point only, I'll give you the time to write. But otherwise, you know, you are not in the class with the uh, mission that whatever is written over here, each and every word has to be in my book. Okay, then after the few sessions, students say, okay, madam, whatever charts you're drawing over here, do you have a, can we get, get a soft copy or can we get a printout of those? To be honest, even I don't have it. Okay, I write it in every class, and then for every class, it's a new file prepared. So there is nothing called of charts or, you know, any soft copy or hard copy of these notes. Right. Yes, absolute discipline expected in the class. Uh, for me, right now, I've already told the administration also that even 10 minutes are very important for me, you know, because for 10, 15 minutes, I can cover three, four questions or half of a standard if the standard is small or something. So your discipline is very important for me and no talking with the fellow person in the class at any cost for whatever I'm discussing in the class. Okay, no having, no, no having a mini lecture in the class. You know, when I tell something, you immediately remember some experience of yours or if, I, if you think sometimes that I am wrong. 
so you can't tell me so no, some of you may even stand up and tell me but some of you you can't tell me so you keep on telling your friend you know no no that's not like that you know no no so that friend who is trying to pay attention you distract him also and you are anyways now not satisfied because nobody is agreeing to your point okay so not in many words but this is what i want to tell you that don't interact with your friends in the class okay no interaction required you only concentrate on the subject yes i don't see the notes being yet provided to you so i think the admissions or whatever are yet to be completed so but uh, still i will start with the standards right now probably the questions i'll start discussing from the question bank once the notes are with you okay you have the latest notes with you the second edition for the new syllabus which in includes the november 18 question paper also the questions which are there from the old for old syllabus also which are common for the new syllabus even those are included over there and relatively if you see the syllabus has not reduced to a great extent but little bit you know the size of the syllabus is less as compared to the old syllabus simple logic for that that our old syllabus book was 650 pages this is 600 pages okay <laughs> so the and you know see bank audit some part of it has been shifted to inter also and uh, some of you who might have studied old or anything of that see if you see up to peer review we have standards then we have ethics caro company audit liabilities of auditor audit committee corporate governance audit of consolidated financial statements non banking financial company public sector undertaking audit under fiscal laws and peer review this is 100% same for old syllabus and new syllabus students so in case if anybody in the class is going to write may 19 number 8 19 in the old syllabus you know the first well these first chapters up to peer review are absolutely same well 100% without a single point of difference between the two and then after that when it comes to bank insurance company and then uh, you know say the chapter on special audit assignments internal control there there is a little bit of difference between the two like insurance company you know old syllabus there is only general insurance company new syllabus you have audit of insurance company which is life insurance also and general insurance also so likewise there is a change but up to peer review 100% same there is no change at all right how many of you are writing your exams in may 19 okay and number 19 those who are writing in may 19 where are your hands you are so confident <laughs> okay first time you are writing in may 19 can i put it that way but that's the only time you are going to write uh, for that you have to pay attention in the class only then that will happen okay right so may november 19 may 20 number 20 okay so no problem at all matlab up to next four attempts if you are attending this class see neither the institute has the capacity to keep on changing the content little bit standards you know there might be a new standard issued or an existing standard revised so there are amendment lectures which are uploaded on youtube okay so and the institute rtp always comes up so you can get the but see standard ethics caro company audit like 90% of it 90 to 95% of it is going to remain the same what i have been teaching see now i can say 70% has been the same over a period of time you know so it's not going to change so it's nothing like that you know that you have to study the just may if my attempt is in may 20 or november 20 or may 21 can i attend the class right now absolutely yes there is no problem about it okay because rather you have so many other classes so whenever you get the time whenever it suits you best you should do the class at the earliest possible okay okay you don't bring any such uh, thoughts of empathy sympathy or any you know okay how can i do it that question only should not arise how can i do it if i don't do it who is going to do it okay the ranks of the institute are waiting for me okay that has to be the approach okay you will don't give any thought for how can i do it you know you can start yes and we'll start with that we'll start with the standards as you might be knowing the standards are of five types if you look at the name of the chapter chapter 1 which is there in our books it is called as the engagement and quality control standards or which could also be called as the quality control and engagement standards yes the quality control and the 
engagement standards right total 46 standards issued by icai okay so now when we are starting with the batch right now first thing as we've now started with standards we will first finish the entire 46 standards in one go so sometimes you know students say in a morning session we can have standards and afternoon study you know ethics or you know company audit or bank insurance so when you study on your own later on you can follow that format you know you study four or five standards and you do bank and you do ethics but right now for us to get a holistic view you know to get a helicopter view of the entire content of these standards it was very important you know that in a link in a series we study the entire standards Okay, so first now in the class, I'll be covering the quality control and engagement standards in which you have one SQC, that is the standard on quality control, just one standard on quality control. Then after that, you have the standards on auditing, right? So SA, that stands for the standards on auditing. So you have the 200, 300, 400, 500 series, yes? You have 570 going concern, 620 using the work of an auditor's expert. Right? So all these standards on auditing, you have the 800 series also, 800, 805 and 810. Right. Then you have the SRE, that is Standards on Review Engagement. So you know, as a practitioner, as a CA in practice, when you're appointed to do an audit, you need to follow the standards on auditing. Then when you're appointed to do a review, you need to follow the standards on review engagement. So, you know, if you look at the question papers before May 18, now whenever I talk about a question paper, it includes both old and new course, both together. Okay, so if you look at the question papers before May 18, the only questions from SRE, that is Standards on Review Engagement, if you look at the question bank, the only ones are from the RTPs. That too, they had put it in the recent past. So, SRE, there used to be no question asked. And now if you see May 18, there is a question on SRE. November 18, again, there is a question on SRE. Yes, that is standards on review engagement. Generally, you are appointed to conduct an audit. An audit in which you express an opinion saying true and fair. And a reasonable assurance which is given by the auditor in the form of a positive assurance. But in case of a review, review is also many a times called as limited review. LR is what it is referred to as. You know, listed companies quarterly, they have an option either to get an audit done or to get a review done. Okay, or, you know, to declare their results earlier. They can first get it reviewed because review takes less time. And then later on, it can be followed by an audit. Okay, so review. So in audit, we give reasonable assurance, whereas review, we give only a moderate assurance. A limited assurance is issued by the, or by the practitioner. Okay, so SRE we have two, SRE 2400 and SRE 2410, right. Then after that we have the SAE, that is the Standards on Assurance Engagement. So now which are these assurance? Already we've talked of audit, we've talked of review. Now we are talking about assurance other than audit and review. Like, you know, the examination of prospective financial information, 31st March 2025, you know, forecast, projection. So prospective financial information, then assurance reports on controls at the service organization, and you have pro forma financial information. So you have three standards over here, 3400, 3402, and 3420 under SAE. And now there is one more on greenhouse statement, 3420, but still now only the exposure draft has come. And I'm saying, what did I tell you right now? 3400, 3402, and 3420. Yes, These are already there. But there is one for which the ICAI has issued a draft, which is on the greenhouse statement. So which is not yet applicable. But, but May 20, November 20 students, you keep it under an observation, okay, whether that new the exposure draft has it been finalized and whether it is now applicable for your exams. Okay, 3410, which is on the greenhouse statements. Okay, right. And the last you have the standards on related services. So audit ho gaya, then review, then after review, you have other assurance other than audit or review, and then you have the related services. Like, you know, CA is appointed for doing the, he is appointed to prepare the financial statements, which is SRS 4410, compilation engagements. 
and you have 4400 which is engagements to perform agreed upon procedures regarding financial information right so two standards in the related standard series okay so one quality control standard sqc yes standard on quality control right standard on quality control then you have the standards on auditing that's the major chunk right then after that sre that is standards on review engagement sae that is standards on assurance engagement it's actually other assurance other than audit or review when a ca is appointed and the last one is the srs that is the standards on related services so as a chartered accountant whether you are doing an audit or whether you are doing a review or whether you are doing any other assurance services or doing some related services your entire firm always needs to follow sqc 1 standard on quality control 1 quality control for firms so sqc 1 is applicable to the entire firm whether the firm is doing audit whether it is doing review whether it is doing any other assurance services or it is doing some related services right so sqc 1 by icai itself calls it as the mother standard you know that it is applicable to the entire firm if you look at the title of sqc 1 okay right now what i'm saying may sound a bit unfamiliar but that is how it becomes familiar when you keep on listening to it over a period of time. Okay, so the title of SQC 1 is Quality Control for Firms. So the standard is applicable to the entire firm. Quality Control for Firms that perform audits and reviews of historical financial information and other assurance and related services engagement. Did you get the title of SQC 1? What, did, what does it say? quality control for firms that perform audits and reviews of historical financial information and other assurance and related services engagement. So whatever be the type of engagement you, which you are doing, you always need to comply with the quality control standard. Who needs to comply with the quality control standard? The firm, you know, the entire CA firm. The practicing CA, he needs to comply with that. Right, so SQC 1, I'll be covering it a bit later. Right, so SQC 1 we'll be discussing a bit later. Right now, starting with the first standard, SA 200, which is on overall objectives of the independent auditor and the conduct of an audit in accordance with the standards on auditing. Right, so overall objectives of the independent auditor. and the conduct of an audit in accordance with the standards on auditing. Yes, overall objectives of the independent auditor and the conduct of an audit in accordance with the standards on auditing. Yes, overall objectives of the independent auditor. Okay, what is the objective of the auditor who is conducting the audit? Right, initially, you know, very much in the beginning, like say in 1980s, when these standards were issued by ICAI, you know, they thought, okay, let there be a standardization in the audit procedures being followed by the auditor. Because, you know, each auditor, he was issuing an engagement letter as he thought should be right, say in 1970 or something. Each auditor issued an audit report as he thought would be appropriate. There was no standard format. There was no standards. So initially, ICAI came up with SAP, that is the Standards on Auditing Practices. So way back when it started, the standards, they were called as SAP, that is Standards on Auditing Practices. Then after that, they were renamed to be called as the AAS, that is the Auditing and Assurance Standards. 
So rather when I had written my exams in November 2008, that time it was AAS. And they used to be serially numbered, AAS 1, AAS 2, AAS 3, like the accounting standards. Right, and then after that, now these standards have been renamed to be called as the engagement and quality control standards. And now why, it's, it's under the series, no? You have 200 series, 300 series. Okay, inter, I, in one batch, I, in, I think in one day one or day two of the class, I told them, so let's study SA 200. You know, overall objectives. So one student, so innocently, he asked me, Madam, 200 standards are there? Because he thought, Madam is starting only directly with 200. So probably 199 are still remaining in the beginning. Okay, so I told it's nothing like that. So that way, so it goes up to 4410. Okay, so it is not like that. It's just the grouping of these standards that, you know, for all audit evidence related are put in the 500 series. All using the work of others has been put in the 600 series. Reporting standards are put under the 700 series. So it is accordingly the series of these standards. And these standards are all in line with the international standards on auditing. So if there is an SA 200, there is also a corresponding ISA 200. That is International Standard on Auditing 200. And if you look at the text of the standard of ICAI, after the entire 200 gets over, they've given over there material modifications as compared to ISA 200. Okay, as in the Indian context, what they have deleted and what they have retained, you know, what is the change as compared to the international standard? Okay, so that's the journey of the standards, starting with the SAP, Standards on Auditing Practices, then becoming the AAS, renamed to be called as the Auditing and Assurance Standards, and now they are called as the Engagement and Quality Control Standards. Okay, right, so what is the title of SA 200? Overall Objectives of the Independent Auditor and the conduct of an audit in accordance with the standards on auditing. Right, so we need to check what is the overall objective of the independent auditor. Yes, what is the objective? You have been appointed as an auditor by the, of a company. You are appointed as the auditor by the board of directors, management, what is wrong with you guys, okay, you are appointed as an auditor by the members of the company, okay, the shareholders, they pass a resolution for the appointment of the auditors, the audit committee, board of directors, they give the recommendation regarding who can be, now you are telling everything, earlier when I asked, why did you say board of directors and management, you didn't have to listen to this in that case, okay, who appoints the auditor of a company? Yes, the members, the shareholders. Okay, and this, what do you say? Impulse reaction, this reflex action which is there now, has to improve further for answering MCQ questions. You know, why Sachin Tendulkar is known to be the best cricketer in the, cricketer in the world is because of his reflex actions. You know, very impulsive, you know, he knows that he, because you have to decide at that moment, okay, the ball is coming at such a high speed and how it is to be hit. So now, similarly, when the question is coming, you have to have a very good reflex, you know, reflex action. Okay, immediately how to tackle, what should be the answer. First, you're giving the wrong question and then thinking of the right one, then you will see it in the suggested. <laughs> so, oh, no, I was thinking only okay, it should be this, but oh, so you think now next time when it comes, I will write correct, but it never comes next time. Okay. <laughs> Right, so overall objective. We need to see what is the overall objective of the independent auditor. Right, so what does the standard say? To obtain a reasonable assurance. What type of an assurance? Reasonable assurance. That the financial statements are free from material misstatements, whether due to fraud or error to obtain reasonable assurance that financial statements are free from material misstatements, whether due to fraud or error, you know, intentional or unintentional. It could be intentional or it could be unintentional. Free from material misstatement, whether due to fraud or error, thereby enabling the auditor so once auditor, he gets this reasonable assurance, it enables the auditor to express an opinion, you know, because what, what auditor has to do, express an opinion as to whether or not the financial statements have been prepared by the management in accordance with an 
applicable financial reporting framework another very important term in your audit syllabus and an audit course AFRF what is AFRF applicable financial reporting framework AFRF yes AFRF so what is the objective of the essay to obtain a reasonable assurance that financial statements are free from material misstatement whether due to fraud or error thereby enabling the auditor so once you get this reasonable assurance then thereby enabling the auditor to express an opinion whether or not the financial statements have been prepared by the management in accordance with an applicable financial reporting framework and then ultimately to issue a report to report his findings and how to report your findings in accordance with the standards on auditing we have the format of the audit report given in essay 700 so you have to report accordingly and in the format provided by essay 700 right the, the essay says that this is the objective of the auditor to obtain a reasonable assurance so now going forward i need to discuss three terms with you from this overall objective yes everybody in the class are you paying attention to me yes reasonable assurance right then free from material misstatement and the third term which we need to understand is the applicable financial reporting framework right so first let's understand AFRF applicable financial reporting framework yes applicable financial reporting framework Yes, today the entire day main my uh, what you say intention today would be to prepare the platform you know, so that you know basic some basic terms related to audit you know some terminology related to the subject okay like you know when you watch a cricket match you certainly know what is an over okay if a two-year child is sitting next to you and he is watching cricket for the first time in his life and you say over ho gaya, so then the child will think it's over the game is over okay but so then you have to tell no in cricket over means six balls you know which is one over one over it has six balls okay that is what it means in cricket okay right so six balls it includes in one so what is a hat trick what is a power play what is a maiden what is a golden duck okay so you know some terminology related to cricket that is why you enjoy the game okay so similarly you should also be knowing some terminology relating to audit like the moment you say reasonable assurance you say free from material misstatement applicable financial reporting framework we always will keep on saying sufficient appropriate audit evidence and so this is all the terminology relating to audit which we should be very familiar and the concept should be clear then only it automatically comes in our case study writing right so applicable financial reporting framework right what do you mean by financial reporting FR is what CA final group one accounts okay right so applicable financial reporting framework could also be called as the applicable accounting framework right the applicable accounting framework if I say the sentence in passive voice like if I just reverse the wordings of the center words yes, it says the framework which is to be applied while doing accounting you know, the framework which is required to be applied which is required to be used while doing the accounting and who is going to do the accounting the management so the framework the laws and regulations this is the definition of AFRF given in the standard the framework the laws and regulations which are to be followed by the management in the preparation of financial statements is what you mean by AFRF the framework the laws and regulations which are to be followed by the management in the preparation of the financial statements example when an Indian company yes example when an Indian company has to prepare its financial statements what framework what laws and regulations are followed by an Indian company Yes, Indian accounting standards in days and schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013. That's so account in days and schedule 3 is an example of an AFRF. It is an example of an AFRF. 
है ना अकाउंटिंग स्टैंडर्ड शेड्यूल थ्री इन डे एस शेड्यूल थ्री वन अ कंपनी इज प्रिपेयरिंग इट्स फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट से रिलायंस इंडस्ट्रीज लिमिटेड इट प्रिपेयर इट्स फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट एज पर इंडियन अकाउंटिंग स्टैंडर्ड एंड शेड्यूल थ्री मीन्स दैट इज द ए एफ आर एफ द एप्लीकेबल फाइनेंशियल रिपोर्टिंग फ्रेमवर्क विच हैज बीन यूज बाई द मैनेजमेंट इन द प्रिपरेशन एंड प्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट सो दैट दे गिव अ ट्रू एंड फेयर व्यू is this clear to everyone applicable financial reporting framework okay say there is an indian company okay but this indian company say d limited okay this indian company say d limited is a subsidiary of a foreign company say which is located in germany so the holding company is a german it's based in german okay say a limited so a holding company is where it is in germany okay d limited is an indian company so obviously this holding company a limited will consider the financial statements of d limited which is an indian company while preparing their consolidated financial statements and not the german company so now you know for consolidation what is required line by line addition so there has to be uniform accounting policies being followed across the group so now see though d limited is an indian company it should use generally what it would have used for preparation of financial statements indian accounting standards and schedule 3 but now because its holding company is in germany and the holding company for consolidation purposes requires this indian company financial statements this german company will in sorry this indian company will now prepare its financial statements as per german gap Okay, so what I want to tell you, okay, see, Indian Accounting Standard Schedule Three is also an example of an EFRF. If an Indian company prepares financial statements as per U.S. GAAP, German GAAP, Hong Kong GAAP, Australian GAAP, even that's an example of an EFRF. But now, further, these EFRF you can understand. Okay, normally. Every Indian company does prepare its financial statements as per Accounting Standard Schedule Three. it's obvious it's but common so that afrf can be taken to be an example of a general purpose framework because generally every indian company does prepare and rather you know this d limited it will prepare two financial statements one accounting standard schedule 3 also and one german gap also because to roc they can't submit german gap financial statements no right so general purpose framework and when an indian company is preparing financial statements as per the requirement of bank or as per the requirement of german gap or us gap that's going to be an example of a special purpose framework right because generally every indian company does not prepare financial statements as per german gap do you agree yes this company because they are holding is in germany they are preparing as per german gap Okay, so I have told you that one there is an AFRF, and second I am telling you that this AFRF it may be a general purpose framework or it may be a special purpose framework. Later on, when I take you to the title of essay eight hundred, later on when I will take you to the title of essay eight hundred, what does the title of essay eight hundred say? Special considerations. just listen to me right now as you don't have the books to see it in the books okay special considerations i'm telling you the title of essay 800 special considerations audits of financial statements prepared in accordance with special purpose framework special considerations audits of financial statements prepared in accordance with special purpose framework so you know as an auditor when i am appointed to do the audit of financial statement prepared as per german gap i am an auditor indian practicing ca i am appointed by an indian company to do the audit of those financial statements which the company has prepared as per german gap i will issue the report under sa 800 yes i will perform the procedures as laid down in sa 800 but if the company has prepared as per accounting standard schedule 3 then 200 210 no special purpose framework it is general purpose framework when the special purpose general purpose framework we will require it further also so is afrf clear to everyone 
applicable financial reporting framework that is the framework the laws and regulations which are to be followed by the management in the preparation of the financial statements okay right then what is the second term which we have over there free from material misstatement so we've seen afrf now let us see free from material misstatements right free from yes material misstatements okay right yes free from material misstatements can anybody tell me what do you mean by a misstatement yes what is a misstatement false statement wrong statement fraud error not necessarily that it will always be a fraud it could also be an error okay so misstatement means there is something wrong in the statement so say inventory by the management of the company has been valued at 120 crore and the management using a you know as2 or with the fifo method weighted average method they have valued inventory to be 120 crore what is this this is what is we had a look at the financial statements of the company and in the books what did we see that inventory is shown as 120 crore then as an auditor we did the audit of this inventory you know, we checked the existence rights and obligation completeness valuation mainly the allocation of inventory right so now when i check the valuation of inventory as an auditor i found out no their inventory is only worth 100 crore the value of their inventory is 100 crore. It is not 120 crore. And what is right now reflected in their financial statements? 120 crore. This is what is. And what should be? 100 crore. So the difference between the two, the difference between what is and what should be is a misstatement. And so what is the formula for misstatement? Difference between what is and what should be. Okay, what is related party disclosures not given? You know, in day is 24, related party transactions disclosures not given. What is? What should be? Disclosure should have been given. Difference between the two? Misstatement. What is diluted EPS not disclosed? What should be? Diluted EPS should be disclosed. Difference between the two? Misstatement. What is leases disclosure not given? What should be? Lease disclosure should be given. Difference between the two? Misstatement. Anything. And you can take an example of anything. What accounting policy, a, accounting standard not followed. What should be? Accounting standard should be followed. Difference between two? Misstatement. What is? Schedule 3 not followed. What should be? Schedule 3 dis disclosure should have been given as per Schedule 3. Difference between the two? Misstatement. Okay. Now, then what is material misstatement? This is misstatement. And now what is misstatement? difference between what is and what should be then what is material misstatement and a materiality any item or information which might influence the decision making of the users of financial statements okay always the entity which we are going to do the audit of is going to be geo limited you know the name of our client throughout the class for example purpose is going to be geo limited and the name of our ca firm is going to be pwc Students ask why. It's simple and easy to write, short to write. Okay, no other reason. Okay, right. So now, when, yes, you are appointed, PwC has been appointed to do the audit of Geo Limited. Okay, and in Geo Limited, you have found out that inventory is 120 crore, whereas actually it should have been 100 crore. But the materiality which you have determined in accordance with SA 320, you know, materiality in planning and performing an audit. <coughs> materiality is one twelve hundred crore. Materiality is how much? Any item or information above twelve hundred crore is going to influence the decision making of the users. And right now, what is the difference over here? Twenty crore. So, is this a misstatement? Yes. Is it a material misstatement? No. So, material misstatement means what? Material difference between what is and what should be. Say, materiality was two crore. Materiality is 2 crore. Then in that case, this 20 crore misstatement becomes a material misstatement. So it depends upon materiality. Yes, as an auditor, our focus is only on material frauds or errors. Yes, material frauds or errors. Okay, so free from material misstatements. You know, when you're doing audit of Reliance, Reliance last year profit was say around 40,000 crore approximately. Okay, so there even if you take 1% as materiality, 
and a 1% of PBT to be materiality, it comes to 400 crore. Okay, so there errors like 200, 300 crore are always ignored. Only big ones like 12,000 crore or 5,000 crore error, only those are considered to be material. Okay, right, so material difference between what is and what should be. That is material misstatement. Then what is free from material misstatement? We understood misstatement, then we understood what is material misstatement. Now what is free from material misstatement? That means there is no, there is no material difference between what is and what should be. Could we combine it on together? What does it say? There is no material difference between what is and what should be. That is free from material misstatement. Yes, so as an auditor, obviously when I have to express an opinion on the true and fair view of the financial statements, can the financial statement be considered to be giving a true and fair view if there are material frauds or errors in those financial statements? There is material fraud, 12,000 crore fraud. Can you express an opinion on those financial statements that they're being, saying that they are true and fair? No. So for an auditor to express an opinion, he needs to obtain a reasonable assurance that these financial statements which I am auditing, on which I am expressing an opinion, they are free from material misstatements, whether due to fraud or error. And regarding this, the auditor needs to obtain a reasonable assurance. Yes, why not absolute? Right? So now we come to the third term, reasonable assurance reasonable assurance which has been defined to be a high level of assurance but not an absolute assurance not 100% 99.9999999% assurance but not 100% say so just to be more practical let me say 95% 97% assurance ke yes I am telling ke these financial statements are free from material misstatement See, when I'm saying reasonable assurance that financial statements are free from material misstatement. And what did I tell you? Reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance. So just as an example, I'm telling you 95%. You know, what is it? I'm telling you that these financial statements are free from material misstatement. Why you cannot tell me 100%? Why 95? Why 97% only? Why not 100% due to the? In inherent limitations of an audit due to the in auditor cannot give a absolute assurance but only a reasonable assurance due to the inherent limitations of an audit and the most important there are many inherent limitation nature of financial reporting nature of audit procedures the timeliness and availability the cost tucking a balance between the cost benefit okay so inherent limitation of the most important inherent limitation is okay, the evidence obtained by the auditor is persuasive evidence rather than conclusive evidence right persuasive evidence rather than conclusive evidence what is persuasive yes convincing most likely to be true than not and you know, a most likely to be true than not persuasive how do you define persuasive yes most likely to be true than not most likely to be true than not. Yes, prima facie, it looks to be okay. Okay, and conclusive evidence, only that is true. Conclusive evidence, how it has been defined as? Only that is true and any other possibility is ruled out. So obviously in an audit, nowhere are we going to get conclusive evidence. We are always only going to get the reasonable evidence. Yes, as an auditor, we do not have the power, or we are only going to get persuasive evidence reasonable assurance we do not have the power of search we are not specialist into authentication of documents so we are if client provides me rent agreement i will check whether it is signed whether the names of the tenant landlord have been given the rent uh, no, the rent per month the interest and uh, the penalty repairs maintenance who is going to take care of the period so if i see all these five seven points which i have to check i will prima facie believe that rent expenditure is appropriate 
but there is always a possibility that it might be a satyam. <laughs> you understand? No, now there are many examples. Rather, satyam is now outdated. There is Nirav Modi, Malia, so many more examples. Okay, right. So most likely to be true than not. Persuasive evidence and conclusive only that is true and any other possibility is ruled out. Once your result has come out, which says 39 out of 100, it is conclusive. And it is conclusive, not persuasive. Uh, okay, right. Or 39 out of 100, I think, is still less uh, of a problem. When it is 58, 58, 58, and 39, that is more bitter, you know, that is more of a problem. Okay, right. So, persuasive. So, see, the correlation is so simple. Right? The correlation is so simple because we get persuasive evidence. We are giving reasonable, reasonable assurance. Had we got conclusive evidence, we would have given absolute, absolute assurance. Hana, had we got conclusive, only that is true, then we would have said true and what are you saying? True and correct. Had we got conclusive evidence, we would have given an absolute assurance, saying that it is true and correct. But that is what is not happening. Right? The Kingston Cotton Mills case, which says that auditor is a watchdog, but he is not a bloodhound. Yes, as an auditor, you are supposed to be cautious. You are not supposed to be suspicious. Right? Auditor, the primary objective of the auditor is not detection of frauds and errors. That is why, what does it say? Persuasive evidence is what we get. That is why we give a reasonable assurance. Had we got conclusive evidence, we would have given an absolute assurance. But that is not the case. Right. So now let's all put, let's put it all together. Yes, the overall objective of the independent auditor is to obtain a reasonable assurance that financial statements are free from material misstatements, whether due to fraud or error, thereby enabling the auditor to express an opinion whether or not the financial statements have been prepared by the management, TCWG, you know, those charged with governance in accordance with an applicable financial reporting framework, and then to report the findings of the auditor if he finds out that you know depreciation essay is not followed uh, depreciation accounting standard is not followed property plant equipment not followed any particular NDA is not followed then to report the findings or schedule 3 disclosures not given then to report his findings in accordance with SA 700 in accordance with the standards on auditing okay Right. You are appointed as an auditor of the company under Section 139 of the Companies Act 2013. And a Section 139 of the Companies Act is regarding the appointment of the auditor. Right. Under Section 143 of the Companies Act 2013, 143 subsection 2 mainly, it is one of the duty of the auditor to report on the true and fair view. Yes, to report on the true and fair view of the accounts examined by him. Two parts of reporting under 143 subsection 2. Whether the financial statements give the information required by the act in the manner so required and whether the financial statements give a true and fair view of the state of affairs, results and cash flows of the entity for the year ended on that date. And a state of affairs, balance sheet, results, profit and loss account, and cash flows, cash flow statement. Right, so what does it say? Section 139, appointment of company auditor. Once you're appointed under 139, under 143, subsection 2, your responsibility is to express an opinion on the true and fair view, whether financial statements give the information required by the act in the manner so required and also whether it gives a true and fair view. Right, if you come to section 129 of the Companies Act, which is regarding financial statements, 139 is what? Appointment of company auditor, 143 rights and duties of the company auditor, 129 financial statements, 128 books of account. Right, so 129, which is regarding the financial statements, it says that financial statements of a company shall be considered to be giving a true and fair view if they are in compliance with Indian accounting standards and schedule 3. And now what does 129 say? Okay, when, will, when can you say that the financial statements of a company are giving a true and fair view? 
when they are in compliance with Indian accounting standards and Schedule 3. So now can anybody draw a direct correlation between 143.2 and Section 129? If financial statements? So as an auditor, when I have to express an opinion on whether the financial statements give a true and fair view, I need to check whether the financial statements are in compliance with accounting standards and schedule 3 because that is what section 129 say. That they will give true and fair view if they are in compliance with AS and schedule 3. So in order to express an opinion on true and fair view, auditor, you need to check compliance with accounting, Indian accounting standards and schedule 3. Right, so this is just a correlation of the company law over here. Okay, right. So then it might be like, okay, what is the title of the essay? Overall objectives. So now we've discussed the overall objective. The standard doesn't get over over. Right, it further talks about the ethics in order to achieve this overall objective. Right, so in order to achieve the overall objective, the standard says that, order, or that auditor, you need to comply with certain other requirements of SA 200 also. Right, what are the other requirements of SA 200? One, it says, auditor, you need to comply with certain ethical requirements, including independence. Yes, auditor, you need to comply with certain ethical requirements including independence yes ethical requirements and in addition to this ethical requirement auditor you also need to comply with the requirement of independence right independence you as you would have studied in inter it says it is a condition of mind and personal character and it should not be confused with the superficial and visible standards of independence sometimes established by law Right, and it says independence means that a judgment of a person is not subordinate to the wishes or directions of another person who might have engaged him or for his own self-interest. Yes, what does it say? Independence, it means that the judgment of a person is not a subordinate to the wishes or direction of another person. Right, say, let me quickly take an example of certain disqualifications which are given under the Companies Act under Section Yes, under section 141, which is regarding the disqualification, subsection 3, which is regarding the disqualifications of the qualifications and disqualifications of the company auditor. So, you know, law has taken a lot of steps. Company law has put a lot of disqualifications for the company auditor in order to ensure the independence of the auditor. You know, like company law says that person, partner of the firm, they cannot hold a single equity share. Why? Because they think that may have an impact on the independence. That's the only reason behind it. No. Okay, indebtedness not allowed. Guarantee not allowed. Relative should not be a director or a key managerial personnel of the company. Right? You should not be, what do you say, fraud. Though it is not related to independence, the one relating convicted any fraud or so. But these ones, where it is regarding any indebtedness, guarantee, officer or employee of the company, a person who is a partner or who is in the employment of an officer or employee of the company, why all these disqualifications have been put? In order to ensure the independence of the auditor. Right? So company law and a person partner, are they allowed to hold even a single equity share or any security or interest of the company which they want to audit rather they can't hold of the company the holding company subsidiary company associate company and any other subsidiary of that holding company you cannot hold even a single equity share relative relative they can hold up to the face value of rupees 1 lakh in the company so person partner relative person partner zero they cannot hold a single equity share relative say uh, there is a limit up to which they can hold beyond which they cannot hold so as of malab, there is a limit over there so as such relative also cannot hold so company law says person cannot hold partner cannot hold relative cannot hold person partner relative you are the auditor of geo limited Tomorrow is the board meeting of Geo Limited. The results are going to be declared by the company tomorrow. Okay, today evening you have the profit and loss account of the company in your hand. You have the draft financial statements in your hand. See, Geo Limited is a listed company. Right, you know that tomorrow the company is going to declare a profit of 1300 crore. 
है ना प्रॉफिट द कंपनी इज गोइंग टू बी डिक्लेयरिंग टुमारो व्हेन द रिजल्ट्स इज गोइंग टू बी आउट दे आर गोइंग टू डिक्लेयर अ प्रॉफिट ऑफ 1300 करोड़ द मार्केट एक्सपेक्टेशन देयर आर एनालिस्ट्स नो हु कीप ऑन डेवलपिंग एक्सपेक्टेशंस रिगार्डिंग व्हाट वुड बी द प्रॉफिट्स व्हिच वुड बी डिक्लेयर्ड बाय द कंपनी सो द एक्सपेक्टेशंस ऑफ द मार्केट द एक्सपेक्टेशंस द फोरकास्टर्स दैट दे शुड बी डिक्लेयरिंग अ प्रॉफिट ऑफ 1000 करोड़ and you know that tomorrow actually the profits which are going to be declared is 1300 crore and the moment these results are going to be declared the share price of the company is going to you know it's going to increase okay so now person cannot hold i cannot hold partners of my firm even they cannot hold even my relative cannot hold so what to do call up friend because friend is not there in the list of disqualification and now call up friend and tell friend purchase 10000 shares 50 50 okay price sensitive information insider trading i know this is an example of sebi law where you study you know we're dealing on the basis of price sensitive information okay so in this case to comply with the requirement of law in the context of company law are you independent have you in the context of company law are you independent yes because you are not holding your partners are not holding your relative is also not holding so if you check as per company law are you disqualified no you are qualified so in this case is there independence in appearance is there independence in appearance to the world legally does it look like that the company has complied with the requirement of law the auditor is independent yes but where is there the independence of mind so the code of ethics stipulates that auditor we want independence not only in appearance but what is also expected is independence of mind right so when you are calling up your friend and you are telling him to purchase the shares then in that case independence in appearance yes but independence of mind no right so you see many ceas you know they set up a private company through that private company they are providing services to the client so in that case again there is independence in appearance but you to violate the requirement of law but there is no independence of mind does everybody understand this and this happens many a time you will get to see a live example of this in the library 80% of the students are studying over there only in appearance <laughs> okay 80% looks like oh my god this time okay certainly they are going to clear okay only 20% you see that you know they are studying from their mind rest only you know they it's like a special like those celebrities they have an airport look i always see you know students they have the library look okay it's like some different they are in a different world all together when they are studying into the library so no it's at home also when you are studying you know say from morning 7 to say if you got up at 5 o'clock in the morning and now it's say up to 12 o'clock and you have not even got up from one place so everybody at home thinks oh my god okay and you know ke from 7 till 5 o'clock till now 12 o'clock or whatever is the time or just two pages of the book you've turned okay right so independence not only in appearance but also independence of mind that is what is required by the code of ethics